So we're just outside the City Archaeology Laboratory, and this whole place is under the purview of one man. And who knew that we had this? It's our very own Indiana Jones here for the city of Boston, the Boston City Archaeologist, Joe Bagley. How are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm doing well. So what does it mean to be the City Archaeologist exactly? So um, as a city employee, I work for the Environment Department, and I do a review for the city. And um, so here's the city of Boston. We have quite a few sites of archaeological sites here in the city. Um, 200 sites currently known in the city at the moment. Just these dots on the map show the sites that we have here in the lab itself. When you say sites that we have here in the lab, what yeah. exactly does that mean? You have like artifacts from these digs? Exactly. So most of these digs have been done in the past 20, 25 years um, by some of my predecessors, former city archaeologists. Um, so we've done surveys all over the city, and some collections have ended up here from other surveys that have happened. Um, everything from Charlestown all the way down to Dorchester, way out Brook Farm and West Roxbury. So we have a lot of, um, a lot of sites represented here at the, at the at the lab, and about about five to seven thousand years of human history Jeez. is kept here in the lab, right, right here, now, in right here in the lab. About so seventeen hundred boxes. When you do a survey of one of these sites, mm -hmm. what what exactly happens? I mean, are you literally there with shovels digging right, exactly. in the ground. Exactly. So we have three phases of archaeology. The first phase is: is there a site here? Second phase is: okay, so there's a site here. Is it important, and how big is it? Mm -hmm. And then a third phase, which is called data recovery, is when we go out and say: okay, this site's really important. We got to get as much information as we possibly can. So we got to open up a lot of land and start trying to see how much archaeology, how much history can we find here at this site. We actually have a photo down here in Charlestown where we had a massive data recovery, phase three. So you can see in this photo, um, this was done in the 80s, uh, yeah. but this is the downtown Charlestown area. This is the city square district. Um, you can see that the, the large area of open excavations, this was done before the big dig happened. So they went in and did a um, large open dig. Uh, this area right here is where they found the Three Cranes Tavern, which is an 18th century tavern in the middle of Charlestown, uh, burned to the ground in the Battle of Bunker Hill. So it's almost like a mini Whoa. Pompeii site where yeah. everything was left there. People fled Charlestown, everything burned. And then in this part of the city, they actually left it untouched. So. 250 years later, archaeologists came in and they basically found everything that was left behind after the city burned to the ground right there on the same spot. And the stuff that was recovered here is just inside the lab? 900 boxes in the back of the lab. Let's go check it out. Let's go. So, Joe, all of this, everything in here is recovered from the big day. Right. All this entire room of boxes. Yeah, all of these boxes are from the Big Dig, from Charlestown alone. So this is the Parker Harris Pottery. This is a 1740s pottery site that was burned during the Battle of Bunker Hill. Uh, this is actually owned by a woman, Grace Parker, in the 1740s. So a pottery site means that she was she was making she was the pottery, pottery there, just right for, there in for people who were living. Yeah, in and we find the pottery the all over the rest of Charlestown. She was making it for her neighbors. Was she city, good? She was great. Uh, this is City Square. Yeah. So this is uh, where the Three Cranes Tavern was. This was like the heart and the the, the soul of the community of yeah. Charlestown. It also burned to the ground in the Battle of Bunker Hill. Uh, wow. But everything we have here is all recovered just from downtown Charlestown. This is all that that photo that we were looking at just before. Exactly. That's yeah. All these brown all boxes these are from that hole. That big open area. Jeez, can we look yeah. inside of one? Yeah, let's go pull one out. So um, this is from the city square, Yeah. which is now a park. So you can go there today and see it. You drive under it under Route 1 during when you're driving to the uh, Tobin Bridge. Yeah. So, so these is, whole things are just under the ground hole like not, that? Not quite whole. You can see that oh, all okay. the different so, breaks in it. So uh, this is actually from a, a what's called a privy. It's essentially an outhouse. Before they had running water, the only place you could put, you put your anything, whether it be trash or your waste, <laughs> would go into the um, to the outhouse or the privy. Um, and this is what you call a chamber pot. So this mm -hmm. is kind of your indoor toilet. Wow. So this would have gone under every bed. Um, and even in dining rooms, this would have been there. And then so you would dump it out into the privy or you would use the privy. Occasionally these got broken or sometimes dropped into the privy. So this actually comes from one of the privies of the Three Cranes Tavern from the 1740s. This is called a white salt clay stoneware. It was made in England. Uh, you can see it's been a bunch of pieces, but it was basically whole uh, or in pieces, but it was put back together to be yeah. essentially whole. So uh, a chamber from, pot from a tavern. So it was probably well tavern. used. It was probably very well <laughs> used, which is probably why we have so many of these. We have literally dozens of chamber pots from Jeez. the Three Cranes Tavern. No kidding. Uh, some of them were made by probably Grace Parker herself. We have yeah. a red rare one. I actually have some examples out on a table. I can show you one that may be actually made by Grace Parker and some of the other highlights of the collection. That's like very to cool. Look. How do you know, I mean, how do you, is it all this catalog? Do you know what's in all of these boxes? We have a catalog um, by today's standards. It's a bit out of date. So we're actually in the process of going back through this and the other 600 boxes, so about 1,700 boxes, Jeez. 800 boxes total of artifacts and recataloging it. So every single thing. Every single thing. Because right now it's item. a paper catalog. We want to make it a digital catalog so we can have researchers from around the world either come or email us and get all the data that they could need for books, publications, compare sites to other places around the world, and actually make all this information that we have in boxes 
available. Publish it. Get it out there. Yeah. Let people know about the history of the city. How many people do you have working for you to be able right to do Right now that? we have quite a few volunteers. Um, everybody from undergrads, high school students, graduate students, people who are retired, people that take off work to come here and do volunteering. And they're all here giving their time to actually make these collections available, studyable, um, and, and out there so that the people of Austin can actually use them. So, but they're volunteers. You don't have any actual employees. It's just no, you. It's just me. I'm a I'm a one person program here. So <laughs> yeah. it's a program of one. And what program kind of, of one. what kind of budget do you have? Uh, right now, my main goal is to save the city of Boston money. So I actually unfunded as a program goes. So we wow. rely on volunteers and donations for all of the work, all of the supplies, all of the publications that we do. All of that's done with the generosity of the public. Wow. Gee, how many artifacts are we talking about total? I think, and I'll know an exact number in about 10 years, but I think... <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, just yeah, 10 years. You know, about that, sure. yeah. Uh, about a million artifacts, I think. Uh, pieces of everything from ceramics to Native American things that were left thousands of years ago, to bones from people's dinner, um, to plastic caps from Boston Common that we recovered in the 80s. So everything's here. The whole history of people here in Boston. We don't cut anything from the story. Wow. So it's all here. Hey, all right. Hi, ladies. Hello. So this is a serious oh, operation you have going on. Yeah, here. so um, these this are volunteers. Archaeology in action. This is the real deal. So these um, these ladies are actually working on cataloging and sorting the Boston Common Collection from 1986. It's okay. been out of the ground for quite a while, but we're now going back and making sure everything's divided up into all the different segments and different ways that we can split up the collection. It's all going into little bags, and then those bags are going to get digitized into our digital artifact catalog, and then researchers, again, from around the world can come and actually use our information that we have here in the lab. So just to point out a couple examples of what's coming out yeah, of the what are we looking at? right now. So this is actually the, we're sorting the area right by the uh, Boylston Tea Station. So okay. um, again, Boston Common, this was all done for the lighting project, where the light post went. Um, so this piece right here, this is what we call blue shell edge pearlware. It's been hand painted around the rim. This is made in England um, sometime around the late 1700s, early 1800s. And you know that just by looking at just it. Just by looking at it. Um, so this is the type of, almost everybody in Boston at this time period had blue shell edge pearlware. It's the most common thing. In fact, okay. it's the most common artifact pretty much found around the world. In place of European set foot in the 1700s, they find this stuff in Egypt. They brought their religion. And their they brought their religion, <laughs> they brought their place, they brought their blue shell of pearlware. Um, this is a piece of stoneware, it's called Vestergold. Um, it's actually made in Germany, you can see how it's been blue and scratched into it. Yeah. Um, the paint there is called the cobalt. It's actually been burned. I'm not sure why or how yet, but uh, this is from the late 1600s to early 1700s. So this is some of the earliest artifacts you can find in Boston. Is this blue Vester Vaults um, German stoneware. Do you know what that would be from? Probably a stein. Uh, back yes. then, the water was not good enough to drink, um, just straight out of the tap yeah. or, or straight out of the bucket. And so everybody made it into beer or alcohol so that it was actually drinkable. So everybody had stein, even kids were drinking back then. So, um, and then this piece right here that Warren has uh, is a piece of creamware. Uh, creamware was invented in 1762. So we know that this artifact dates to at least that time period, yeah. probably to the very early 1800s. Um, it's hard to tell what it is just from a small piece like that, but it's probably something like a plate. A lot of stuff seems to have gotten to the Boston Common in order to fill in low spots of the common. So we're getting a lot of like the local trash from the area around the common, probably Beacon Hill, coming down the hill in the, the trenches that the British troops dug during the Revolutionary War. Those were still open in the 1800s, so they need to fill those in. So all the garbage came down the hill, oh, wow. was put into those trenches. And that's why we end up finding all these plates, all these um, daily use things, uh, whether it be wine bottles or nails from the houses or pipe stems from smoking on the common, um, even roofing slates, like this piece of slate. I love how that you can tell what everything is. Just, I mean, you know what everything is just by these You have to because tents, this is actually fairly large in some sites. Uh, you get even smaller pieces than this. So you get really good at telling what something is from really tiny fragments. Like, like I know that this piece is from the 1760s. I know that this piece is from the 1790s just because one's slightly bluer than the other. But that's the kind of stuff that we have to train. That's what we're doing here. We're learning how to tell the difference between these artifacts just from looking at them and trying to piece out a little bit of clues that are there. Um, sometimes it's just as, as subtle as the slightly yellow versus slightly blue. Wow. So you said that even these small pieces are big compared to some sites. Does anything ever come out like whole or do you ever have something that you can be like, this is a whole thing that we Almost have? Almost never. The only real exception is privies like we saw in Charlestown with some yeah. of those larger vessels, but even those tend to be always broken. Because if you figure it's been underground for a couple hundred years, the weight of the soil on top of it, 
the, the deposition that's happened in order to put it into the ground, it tends to break everything. So finding anything whole, almost unheard of. I mean, yeah. literally almost completely unheard of, unless it's really tiny and manages to not get crushed over time. Very cool. So what are some of the like highlights, highlights, highlights of the collection? Actually, I have a couple out on the table over there. Some from Boston Common, Fano Hall, and, um, and uh, the rest of Charlestown. We have some uh, great artifacts, though. Cool. Let's check them out.